my friend from Columbus, Mississippi. His name is Pastor Jason Delgado, and he is pastoring a church called Vibrant Church, and they are a vibrant bunch in Columbus, Mississippi. And he is a friend of my life and connected with this guy a couple years ago. We've just been talking a lot on the phone. Went to be in his church uh, last May and preached for him. Great congregation, great church, great pastor. He is a Puerto Rican from Mississippi. It's going to be a great night. I'm just saying right now. We're going to have church, so please be prepared. Would you welcome my friend, Pastor Jason Delgado. Tell them what's up. <laughs> so good to be here uh, tonight. You can be seated. I just consider it such a tremendous honor um, to be here in, in this great church that God's building and the tremendous leaders that you have. I want to honor your pastor and his wife, Pastor Marty and, and Becky, uh, tremendous friends to, to me. And God's just kind of connected us together as friends. And for him to Extend the invitation for me to share my heart tonight is a, is a big honor. And I just want to tell you guys, in case you haven't known it, you're under some good leadership here at Harvest Time Church. Amen, everybody. Come on, y'all are spoiled rock. You know that? You're just spoiled rats. Amen. So good to be here. And I just want to take a moment, and this is kind of out of the ordinary, but um, Pastor, I just, want to, I just want to share with you something that uh, I felt in my, in my spirit as we were worshiping. I just want to, I just want to speak to you. And they can, they can just do whatever they want to do. But in my spirit as we were worshiping, I saw you, both of you, leading your church for a long time through dense foliage. And you were out front with a machete and just kind of plowing and plowing. And it was, it was hard. And people were following you guys. And it was just this pioneering, this plowing and this plowing and sweating and but there was a lot of unity and a lot of passion, not knowing what's ahead. And I saw in my heart, and I just want to encourage you, I felt like the Lord just wanted me to encourage you guys tonight, that there's coming a clearing from the foliage. And I saw a big meadow that you guys had found after a long time of sl slinging a machete. You're, you and your whole church behind you, sweaty and dirty, entered a meadow. And I saw in my spirit during worship that everyone took off running. And just was excited and laughing. And I really believe there's a season that you're about to step into where the, the machetes are going to get put away. And the running through a meadow and the multiplication that God is going to bring to this house is going to happen. And I just want to encourage you with that tonight. Amen. Amen. So good to be at Harvest Time. Are you guys ready to get in the Word of God tonight? All five of you. That's awesome. Y'all ready to get in God's word tonight? Come on, is there any expectation in the house uh, tonight? If you have your Bible, your iPhone, your iPad, whatever you got, if you would turn to uh, 2 Kings chapter 6. 2 Kings chapter 6 tonight. I just want to share my heart with you for a few minutes. Just lean into the word of God. I'm a, I'm a holler back preacher, so y'all got to engage uh, with me in, in the message. We're going to get excited together, and I really believe at the end of this, how many just expect that we're going to leave this place saying, surely we have been in God's presence tonight. Amen, everybody? It's going to be an awesome night, but I want to talk to you tonight uh, from the topic, get your edge back. Get your edge back. Everybody say, get your edge back. Yeah. Tonight, I, I'd like to look at the prophet Elisha, one of my favorite characters uh, in prophets in all of Scripture. Before we dive into the, to this tonight, I wonder tonight, how many of you are like me, and you're often looking for things you misplaced? Come on, raise your hand real high. You ever had this problem, right? It absolutely drives me crazy how much time I have spent looking for things I've lost, right? Rachel says, well, they're not lost, they're just misplaced. But to me, if they're misplaced, come on, they're lost, right? And by the way, can I just show you my beautiful family real quick? Do you guys have the picture of my family? Okay, so this is my family. This is my wife, Rachel, and that's my daughter, Ava, and my son, Nathan, and Trace. That's, that's the best part of me, and I praise God for my family. They couldn't be here tonight, but I'm so glad for them 
and uh, I love them. I miss them, and, and I'm just so grateful for my family. They're just beautiful. I'm the ugly one, and so we just work together. It's just awesome. But my wife says, you didn't lose it. They're just misplaced. But to me, if something is misplaced, it's, it's lost. And so I'm looking for stuff all the time. And the most frustrating thing to me is so often I actually have that thing in my possession when I'm looking for it. It's actually crazy, y'all. I've, I've looked for sunglasses that are in my shirt. Y'all feel what I'm talking about? Like, I've looked for car keys when they were in my pocket. One time I was in such a rush and couldn't find my phone, and I was actually carrying it in my hand. And I literally grabbed my wife's phone and set my phone down, grabbed her phone to dial my number to find my phone that I had just set down. It's nuts, y'all. Come on, if you ever had this happen to you, please, in the name of Jesus, raise your hand so I don't feel so stupid, right? It drives me crazy. Well, as we enter a new year, what I want to do tonight is I want to talk about losing something else. There's a good chance that for many of you, you've actually lost something spiritual in nature. As you enter 2019, maybe your body entered a new year, maybe your mind entered a new year, but just maybe you lost something back in 2018 that didn't follow you into this new year. Maybe you lost something spiritual. And now you've entered a whole new year wondering, how can I get it back? Some of you have lost a, a passion for God and a, a passion for the things of God that you used to have, but you don't have today like you used to have. Some of you have lost some joy. There, there used to be this, this deep, settled spiritual contentment and this joy that somehow along the way you've, you've lost and you're not quite sure how you lost it. Some of you at one time had, had great faith and, and you prayed and you prayed and, and you believed God for big things and you had a hope in a God who is good and plans to bless you and to, and to prosper you. But today, you're not praying for, for much of anything anymore. You're not even sure what you believe about any of it, to be honest with you. You had something very important spiritually, but somehow you've, you've lost that along the way. And as we look at the prophet Elisha, we're going to look at what honestly is one of the oddest miracles in all of the Bible. In fact, if you look through it and you survey the different miracles that Elisha performed in his ministry, there's some really big ones. There's some really important ones that he did. For one, he, he healed a poisonous body of water, which actually saved an entire community. He raised a boy from the dead. He, he provided for a widow who, had just, who was about to lose her two sons after already losing her husband. He healed Naaman, a commander in 2 Kings uh, chapter 5. He healed him of leprosy after Naaman dipped seven times in a river. He, he blinded an entire army in order to move forward the things of God in a battle. He did all these significant things. And this miracle that we're going to look at tonight, basically that there was this kind of a, a seminary student, if you will who had borrowed an axe, and he was chopping down a tree when the axe head flew off the handle of this axe, and it flew right into the water. And the Bible says that Elisha, the man of God, he takes a stick, and he throws it in the water, and the axe head floats to the top of this water. Tremendous miracle. But we hear that, and we think, wow, you know, okay, well, you know, what does that even mean, right? He, he made an axe head float, and we're kind of like, wow, that's really cool and everything, but I don't really see how that applies or pertains to my life. Well, let me just give you a couple of things that are significant to me, and then we'll dive into the story. One thing you need to know tonight is that iron was extremely valuable at this time in history. It was extremely valuable. In fact, it was very hard to come by. The younger prophet in this story who was basically studying for ministry, he, he had lost the ax head. He was likely a very poor, poor young man. He was kind of like a Bible college student. You know, he was living on student loans. He was eating ramen noodles. Come on, some of y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And the Bible says that he had actually borrowed this ax head. So it wasn't his. It was borrowed and he lost something very valuable and he couldn't pay it back. And so he was what we'd call a non-profit prophet. Come on, work with me, people. Come on, work with me tonight, all right? And so this young man doesn't have much, and he, he loses this, this valuable axe head. 
Which shows us very clearly, first of all, that our big God actually does care about the little details in our life, which I don't know about you, but that's very comforting to me. That no matter what you're going through right now, if you got a headache, God cares about it. If you got a chemistry test coming up, God cares about it. If your car won't start in the morning, God cares about it. If you can't find your phone and it's in your hand and you can't find it and you put it down to use your wife's phone to call your phone, you need to know God is laughing at you, but he cares. Come on, anybody glad that God cares about the little things? Amen. Now let's dive into this story and I want us to see some, some valuable principles that we can pull out of this and apply them to our life. And again, let me just help you understand the context of the story. If you remember, Elisha was mentored by the prophet Elijah. And so now we see Elisha mentoring the next generation of young prophets who wanted to learn from him. And so there's all these younger prophets, and they're looking up to Elisha because of his resume. You know, he's, he's done all these things, and there's posters of him. You know, he is the great prophet, and they're looking up to him, and they idolize him, and they're saying, man, Elisha, you are the man. Like, you are the bomb.com, man. Can we, can we come, come study underneath you? Can we, can we just learn from you? Will you just take us under your wing and let us watch you and, and learn from you? And so Elisha, the Bible says, he built this school for the prophets. He built basically a school of ministry. And the Bible says there were so many young prophets who were gifted that, that were being drawn to him to learn from him that they actually outgrew the school that they had first built. And that's where we pick up this story, and I want you to look at it with me in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 1. The Bible says the company of the prophets, so this is the student body of this school. The company of the prophets said to Elisha, look, the place where we meet with you is too small for us, so it's time to build a new building. They said, let us go to the Jordan where each of us can get a pole and let us build a place for us to meet. And he said, go. Then one of the students said, won't you please come with us, your servants? And I will, Elisha replied. And so he went with them. And they went to the Jordan. They began to cut down trees. Now here comes the action. Don't miss this. It says, as one of them was cutting down a tree, the iron axe head fell into the water. And so he's down there and he's chopping away, chop, 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 chop. And all of a sudden the axe head flies off and plop right into the water. And so, oh no, my Lord, he cried out. It was borrowed. And the man of God asked, where did it fall? And when he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick, threw it in there and made the iron float. Lift it out, he said. And the man reached out his hand and he took it. Now, Besides God caring about the little details, there's one major point that I want you to embrace in your spirit tonight as we journey through this. And we're going to come back to it again and again in this message. And here's what I want you to see. If you're taking notes, write this down. And that is this. God knows how to help you find what you did not mean to lose. God knows how to help you find what you did not mean to lose. Those of you who are entering this new year, but you've lost something spiritual in nature, can I just remind you that we serve a God of restoration. We serve a God who knows how to help you find what you did not mean to lose. Anybody glad that we serve a God who is a restoring kind of a God? Amen. Now, as we talk about losing the ax head, as we talk about uh, losing our spiritual edge, what I want you to do is what we're going to do tonight is I want to metaphorically, I, I want to show you metaphorically how this applies to your life. And I want to preach through this symbolically because the big question I want to ask you is this, how have you lost your spiritual edge? How have you lost your spiritual edge. Be real honest about it in your heart tonight because you didn't show up to revival tonight because you didn't have nothing else to do. You didn't show up because you weren't busy. You didn't show up because you were just sitting at home bored. Deep within every one of us, the reason you're here tonight, the reason I'm here tonight, the reason we've assembled into this place tonight is because deep down in our spirit, there is a hungering for something more. We know there's more. We have something out there that we want. And so we come into this place and we seek the face of God and open up our heart because there's something out there that we're seeking and wanting from God. Can you say amen, everybody? Some of you may say, well, I really haven't lost my spiritual edge. And if that's you, listen, I celebrate with you. I, I thank God for you. 
And I just want to encourage you to continue doing whatever it is you're doing that keeps that spiritual passion high and keeps your spiritual edge sharp. But it is my guess that for many of you, you might honestly say, you know what? There was another time in your life when you were more into the things of God than you are today. And so I'd ask you to acknowledge tonight specifically and honestly, how have you lost your spiritual edge? For some of you, you might recognize that there was a time in your life when you had committed Christians around you that built you up and and they prayed for you and encouraged you in the things that matter most. But when you look around now, you you, you have some, some kind of Christian friends, but they're really not building you up in the things of God and you've lost your edge because of that. Some of you, there was a time when you served faithfully in your church, in the ministry of your church, and you had this thrill of being used by God and making a difference with your gifts and making a difference with your talents. And sometimes it was hard, but all the times it was fulfilling. And then you got busy and you stopped and you were going to get back to it, but you never did. And now you're missing something because you remember what it was like to be used by God. But now your life is just pretty much all about you. You've lost your edge. Some of you, you remember the hunger that you used to have for the Word of God. And you couldn't wait to open up your Bible every day and let the Holy Spirit speak to you through His Word. And you were feeding on it. And as it was changing you and transforming you and it was renewing your mind and it was drawing you closer to God. And you couldn't, you couldn't you could feel the Spirit of God working in your life through His Word. But then you got busy. And you set your Bible aside and days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months and you slowly lost that conscious presence of God in your life. You lost your spiritual edge. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Some of you, there was a time when you had a passion for prayer. I mean, you'd even get up early in the morning and you would pray long for for other people and for your church and your family and for people to come to Christ and for God to do miracles in different ways. And now, honestly, you may pray over a meal every now and then or when people are watching, or you may only pray about the big things in your life, but the truth is you haven't prayed in a meaningful, significant way in a long time. You've lost your edge. Some of you at one point in your life, you, you really love to share your faith with other people. You had a deep love for those who were outside of the family of God, but something happened along the way. And even though you used to really, really try to reach others who are far from Christ, now you can't even remember the last time you had a spiritual conversation with someone who was not a follower of Jesus. Some of you, if you're really honest, you would notice that your standards, your standards have eroded over time. Years ago, you had strong Christian values based on the heart of God for your life and you thought you know what I'm not going to hang out with these certain people I'm not going to do these certain things because that's not pleasing to God it's not helpful to me and my family but then I don't know something happened and you got these new friends now and they they said come on come on come on and you're like okay I'll just go this once and then before long you started cutting some corners and taking some shortcuts and going places and doing things with them that you probably shouldn't have been doing and now you wake up and you wonder how did I get way over here I have no idea what happened to me I used to but now look where I ended up how have you lost your spiritual edge because the reality is it can happen to anyone Because you need to know that we have a real spiritual enemy whose mission is to steal and to kill and to destroy everything that matters to the heart of God for your life. In fact, let me tell you what happened to me many years ago. I'm just going to be blunt honest with you tonight. I'll just be very transparent. And I don't have time to get into all of my testimony. That's for another day. I grew up in a, I grew up in a pastor's home. I'm third generation pastor in my family. I was born in a pew. Come on, somebody. This is how I work, you know. And I remember that by the time I had reached my sophomore, junior years of high school, I was called to ministry in a supernatural experience at the time I was 13 years of age. By the time I'd reached my sophomore and junior year of high school, I had become so disenchanted with the church and so disillusioned spiritually, and I was being pulled into the world and by influences at school and peers around me and and I became very angry and very resentful. And I was resentful toward my, hated my parents, could not stand the church, could not stand anything about it. 
totally went into rebellion. A very, very dark, dark time in my life involved in some, uh, some things that if I were to, to tell you what they were that would make you blush tonight. Very self-destructive behaviors and mindsets and attitudes. And when I turned 18 years old, I just wanted to get away from church and get away from God and get away from my parents and out of my city. And so I signed up and I joined the Marine Corps. And I went off into the Marine Corps for four years. And the enemy just had a heyday with my life because in the Marine Corps, when I was away from the accountability of my home, that lifestyle of self-destruction magnified a hundredfold over. So many times I should have been dead through different circumstances, but by the mercy and the grace of God, he spared me. Even when I was faithless, come on, he was faithful. And he spared me by his grace and his mercy. Until one day, and I don't have time to get into all the details, but he pursued me relentlessly so hard that he found me where I was. And in the dirt and the disgusting mire of my sin and my filth, he shed his mercy and his grace on my life and he reclaimed me. And I surrendered to him afresh and anew and all the junk washed out of my life and I felt healing and, and, and peace and strength come back into forgiveness and grace. And after I came back to Jesus, I was a new creation in Christ. Man, I, I love God so much. And then I, had, I, I started to passionately embrace the call of God on my life for ministry that I had been running from for years. I started having this renewed passion for something that happened at 13 years old that I had been running from. And, and at that time as a young man, my passion and my dream was that God would use me as a pastor to reach other broken people. And one day I got to be a pastor. And I was so excited as a young man being, I was a 23 year old senior pastor. That's suicide y'all. But I was so excited as a young man that I had the opportunity to do it. And I just knew as a pastor, my Bible would then hover above my desk as I studied, you know. I just knew that when you turned out the lights, I would glow in the dark because the anointing glows in the dark. Amen, everybody. But what I didn't realize as a young man that I had been called to a very difficult job that literally beat the life out of me. It was really, really hard. And over time and over years of pastoring, the way that I was doing the work of God destroyed the work of God in me. I remember one Sunday when I began to lead the church in prayer after worship that I pastored and I realized I hadn't prayed personally all week long. I was praying publicly, but I wasn't praying privately. I would study the Bible, but it was only to preach. It wasn't for personal devotion and personal revelation. And it was in the middle of this season that God showed me a very, very clear indicator of what had happened to my life over all these years. He, he showed me that I had become a full-time pastor and a part-time follower of Jesus. And the reason it's real quiet right now is because some of you can relate to it. You become a part-time parent, a full-time parent and a part-time follower of Jesus. You become a full-time business person and a part-time follower of Jesus. You become a full-time student and a part-time follower of Jesus. You didn't mean to lose your edge, but you did. You didn't mean to stop praying, but you did. You didn't mean to fall back into some old patterns and become addicted again, but you did. You didn't mean to drift from the love and intimacy that you had with God and wake up depressed and empty and hollow on the inside, but you did. You didn't mean to, uh, to, to, to end up pursuing the emptiness of material possessions, but if you were real honest, you'd realize tonight that that's exactly what you did. You didn't mean to become a, a part-time follower of Jesus, but that's what you did. You lost your spiritual edge. So what do you do when, you, when you're swinging away at life and all of a sudden the edge flies off and you lose it? How do you, how do you get your edge back? I want, to I want us to look again at this story of Elisha and the young prophet and symbolically apply two lessons, just very simple, two lessons about how we get our edge back. Anybody want to get your edge back? Come on, y'all. Y'all ready, ready to get into this? If you're ready, say yes. yes. Number one, write this down if you're taking notes. How do you get your edge back? Number one, we need to be honest about where we lost it. We need to be honest about where we lost it. In verse six of this story, interesting thing that Elisha says, the Bible says that the man of God, Elisha, he asked, where did it fall? 
In other words, the axe head is not gone. Watch, it's not gone. It's just where you left it. Where did it fall? And I would ask you, where did you lose it? Where did you lose your spiritual edge. Come on, you're all smart people. If, if, if you look back, you could probably say, oh yeah, I remember when, when, when I took that wrong turn and I made some friends that were probably the wrong friends. Or, you know, I remember I started dating the wrong guy and he took me down. Maybe for you, it was you dropped a, a discipline, a biblical discipline. You used to pray and you stopped. You used to be devoted actually to searching for God and his word and then you stopped. You used to be a tither, but then you kind of got behind, and so you just stopped, and you wonder why you've lost the joy of worshiping God and trusting Him with your resources and watching Him provide for you. You used to, but you stopped. You used to be involved in a great small group where other believers were speaking into your life, and then you stopped. Some of you, maybe you got hurt by somebody in church. Maybe it was somebody, a staff leader. Maybe it was somebody else in the church. And you're like, hey, you know what? If they're going to act that way, well, just forget all of them. I can't take this anymore. And you walked away from God's house and you allowed your heart to grow cold and you allowed it to grow hard. Watch. And you blame God for what somebody else did. First, be honest about where you lost it. For me, I'll just be gut level honest with you. Here's what happened to me in my early years of ministry when I was going through this. As a pastor, I started to care more about what other people thought about my spiritual life than I even cared about my spiritual life. I cared more about the appearance than I did the substance and the reality of it. Come on, be honest about where you lost it. The second thing I believe this text would teach us is this, and this is number two. With God's help, Take back what you lost. With God's help, take back what you lost. Because our God specializes in helping us find what we did not mean to lose. In verse 6 and 7, here we see it. The Bible says, when he showed him the place. Where'd you lose the axe head? When he showed him the place, Elisha cut a stick and he threw it in there and made the iron float. And then look what, look what he said. Then Elisha said, lift it out. Touch somebody next to you and tell them, lift it out, right? Touch, the, touch your second choice person and tell them to lift it out too. Come on, we gotta lift it out. He said, lift it out. Lift it out. Now watch, the Bible says this. Then the man reached out his hand and he took it. Everybody say, he took it. Lift it out. With God's help, lift it out. With God's help, take it back. With God's help, take back what you lost. Listen, don't miss this. Only God can make the ax head float. But he wants you to lift it out. He wants you to take back what you lost as he brings it back within your reach. Now, let me warn you. Let me warn you. The moment you start to think, maybe I can get it back. Yeah, maybe I can get it back. I've lost some spiritual edge. Maybe I can get back what, what I lost. The minute you start to think, maybe, maybe I can get it back. I can promise you this. There's going to be a voice in the back of your head that's going to start talking to you and start telling you, oh, no, you can't get it back. It's been too long. You've gone too far. You've done too much. And you can never have it back. All the things you've done, you have lost the very best of what you could have ever had. And I don't know who this is for, and I don't know who I'm preaching to tonight, but I feel like encouraging somebody right now that with God, it is never too late to be the person that he called you to be. It's never too late to get back what you thought you would never lose. It's never too late to have what you used to have, and even more of it with the power of our good God. You haven't gone too far. You haven't done too much because our God specializes in helping you find what you did not mean to lose. And what does God want you to do? What's your responsibility? What's he asked you to do? Here's what happens. God is going to bring it right within your reach. He's going to lift it up from the depth. He'll bring it right within your reach. But listen, you have to lift it out. 
You have to grab it. You have to take it back. You have to go after it. You have to go get it. So here's what you do. You do what only you can do and you trust God to do what you cannot do. That's so good. I'm going to say it again because some of you missed an opportunity to get into this message right now. You simply do what you can do. Come on, you trust God to do what you cannot do. Right? Let me ask you this. Can you make an axe head float to the surface of the water? No, you can't. But you know what you can do? You can lift it out when he brings it within your reach. Can you create within your heart a passion for a spiritual passion? And can you create in your heart faith? No, you cannot do that. But here's what we know. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you can put yourself in a place where you are hearing the word of God so God can build your faith. It's why it's important for you to be in church every time the doors are open. It's why it's important for you to be in a life-giving church and not a dead church. It's important for you to be under an open heaven with good leaders and good spiritual leadership because my family needs it, my marriage needs it, my children need it. Too much is on the line. You do what you can do and you trust God to do what only he can do. How many believe that God hears and answers prayer? Amen. So you know what you can do? You can choose to pray even when you don't feel like it. Come on, you can choose to worship even when you don't feel like it. You can choose to share your faith with other people even when you don't know all the answers to the questions you're asking yourself. And you can choose to search for God again. And when you seek him, the Bible says, when you seek him with all of your heart, you will find him. Oh, come on, somebody. Take back what you lost. Take back what's valuable to you. I love what Revelation chapter 2 and verse 4 says. Jesus was speaking to a church of people who were where many of us are. And he said this. He said, you have forsaken the love you had at first. Everybody say first. Forsaken the love that you had at first. Then Jesus said, consider how far you have fallen. Then what did he say do? What's the next word right there? He said, repent. You know, repent, the word repent, repentance has become a dirty word in our culture. Repentance is not a dirty word. It's a healing word. Do you know what repentance actually means in the Greek? The word repent in the Greek actually means to change your mind. It just means I was going in one direction and I decided to stop and change my mind and go in the other direction. That's what repentance is. It is a change of mind. It is when you say, you know what, this is what's going on in my life and what I've allowed and where I've ended up. But you know what I've decided to do, God? I've just decided to change my mind. I've just decided to change my thoughts about it. I've decided to line myself up back with the intent of your heart. I'm going to change my mind. That's what repentance is. He said, Jesus said, repent. In other words, say you're sorry, turn back, come home, turn from the apathy, turn from your complacency, repent and do what? Repent and do the things you did at first. Everybody say first. Do the things you did at first. Do the things you did at first. Do the things you used to do. Do the things you did at first. In other words, if you want what you once had, you've got to do what you once did. When God causes it to float, you reach out and you grab it. You grab hold of it and you lift it out and you take it back. You do what you can do and you trust God to do what you cannot do. Is there anybody in here tonight who's glad that we serve a God who wants to help you get back what you did not mean to lose? I don't know about you, but I'm glad that we serve a God of restoration. The book of Joel, I love what it says in the book of Joel. It says that he will help restore the years that the locusts have eaten from your life. There's actually a scripture in Proverbs 6 that says, when the enemy steals something, he's got to pay it back seven times over. 
And some of you tonight feel like your enemy has robbed you of something and stolen something from you. And it's time to tell him, Satan, on the authority of the word of God, you are paying back all of it with interest seven times over. And I'm serving notice on you tonight. You thought I was hot back then. Get ready because I'm coming back seven times hotter in 2019. Come on, if you believe that, give God some praise right now. Because our God specializes in helping you get back what you did not mean to lose. Come on, how many believe that what the enemy meant for your evil, God can turn around and use for your good? I don't know where you are. I don't know how, how you're hurting tonight or, 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 or how far you've drifted or how far you've gone. But God wants you to know you haven't gone too far. You can be everything that he's purposed you to be in your life. Because our God specializes in helping people find what they did not mean to lose. The worship team would just come. I want to encourage you with this scripture. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, I want you to listen to this and just let this encourage your heart. I like how the message version, the message translation says it. So I'm going to read it to you from the message. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 3. The Bible says, God... Your God, everybody say my God. God, your God, will restore everything you've lost. He will have compassion on you. He will come back and pick up the pieces from all the places that you were scattered. No matter how far away you end up, God, your God, will get you out of there. And bring you back to the land of your ancestors that they once possessed. It will be yours again. He will give you a good life and make you more numerous than your ancestors. Why? Why does God do that? Because we serve a God who specializes in helping people find what they did not mean to lose. Come on, that's how good our God is. And I believe he's going to make the axe head float in somebody's life tonight. Tonight is the night that you reach out and you grab hold of it and you lift it out and you take it back. Come on, we're going to get our edge back in 2019. I really believe harvest time is going to get a new edge in a new year. Come on, if you believe that, can you just stand on your feet tonight? Can you just clap? Clap your hands and give God some praise that he is a God of restoration. And he will help you find what you did not mean to lose. Right now, every head bowed and every eye closed. I first want to address those of you who may be here tonight. Maybe a friend invited you. Maybe you wandered in on your own just out of curiosity. But the truth of the matter is that your heart is far from God and you know it. It's not that you don't believe in him. You just don't have any relationship with him. And you know it and he knows it. And if that's you, guess what? You come to the right place. You think you may be here out of your own curiosity or by your own attendance and your own will, but let me just tell you, God had a divine purpose for you being here tonight. Because he's drawing you to himself. And you may think in your heart, man, there's no way after where I've been and what I've done that God would ever want a relationship with someone like me. Can I tell you, my friend, that is a lie straight from the pit of hell. God is not mad at you. God is madly in love with you, just like you are. You see, religion tells us, and this is the problem with a lot of us who grew up in religious environments and we didn't even really know it. Religion tells you, no, no, you've got to clean yourself up before you come to a holy God. The problem with that is, doctrinally, you can't clean yourself up. It's impossible for anything you do to please a holy God. 
But religion says, oh, you got to clean yourself up before you come to church. you got to clean yourself up before you worship. you got to clean yourself up before you come to a holy God. That is not the gospel. The good news of the gospel is you come the way you are, and Jesus says, I will clean you up. I will forgive you. I will give you grace. I will give you a new purpose and a new life. In this, in this moment, I really believe that God's going to call some people to himself by his grace and his mercy. Because the truth is, some of you are here tonight, and you're here in body, but your heart is far from him. You feel like there's a huge gap between you and God right now. You feel like he's a thousand miles away from you. And I don't know what created the distance for you between you and him. Maybe it was things that you've done, because sin does separate us. Maybe it was things that were done to you. Regardless of what it is, God wants to bridge the gap tonight. It comes by one word, and that is the word surrender. It's when you stop where you are and repent, change your mind, and say, you know, God, I'm coming back. I'm coming back home to you where I belong. I don't like this gap. I want to feel you again. I want to feel clean again. I want to feel forgiven. I want to feel your grace. I want to feel your presence in my life. I'm not in a right relationship with you. I'm not in right standing with you, but tonight is the night. I'm not having another year like I did 2018. I don't want to do it on my own. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, if that's you tonight and you say, you know what, I really want a fresh start with God. I just want a fresh start with Him. I want my slate clean. I want to feel forgiven. I'm just going to ask you to let me pray with you right where you're standing. Just right where you are. But if that's you tonight, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want you to be bold. Say, it's me. And I want you to lift your hand right now. Come on, all over this room. Come on, be bold. Be bold. Be bold. Raise it up. Let me see you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. You and you and you and you. Let me see you. You, 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 you and you. God bless you and you over here. People coming to Jesus. Thank you, Father. And I want to lead you in a very simple prayer of surrender and forgiveness and faith. And as I do, I just want you to pray with me. And we're going to pray with you as a church family, all of us together. We're going to pray with you because we're all in this thing together. And we just want to celebrate this moment with you. But I want us all to pray. And if you raise your hand, I just want you to mean this from your heart. Everyone right now say, dear God, thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me clean. I surrender all that I am completely to you. Fill me with your spirit. Teach me to live for you. Thank you for a fresh start and a new beginning. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Come on in the church to celebrate all those coming to Jesus tonight. Isn't that awesome?